Hello church, uh, Derek Clark here, elder of Bethany Baptist Church. Uh, what a year it's been, huh? Australian wildfires, COVID-19, murder hornets, uh, economic collapse, skyrocketing unemployment, racial conflict, uh, tropical storms in the Midwest. We're only halfway through the year. What in the world is going on? It just seems like everything's out of control. Or is it? One of my favorite books of the Bible is Job. Uh, many, of you are, many of you are probably pretty familiar with Job's account. He was a good man. In fact, the book starts out immediately in verse 1 saying that Job was blameless and upright and that he feared God and shunned evil. He was blessed with a wife, 10 kids, and enormous wealth. Yeah, he really had a pretty good life. Um, chapter 1, verse 3 says that Job was the greatest of all the people of the East. One day, Satan is kind of hanging out and comes to talk to God and Satan and God get in a little bit of a disagreement about how good Job actually is. God insists that Job is indeed blameless and upright, and Satan insists that it's only because Job is living the dream and that God has protected Job from hardship. So God decides to allow Satan to test Job, and Satan winds up putting him through some tests that honestly would probably break most men. So Satan gets to work, and in pretty rapid succession, things completely spiral out of control for Job. He loses many of his servants in an enemy raid. He loses all of his sheep and more servants when, uh, as verse 16 says, the fire of God fell from heaven. Another enemy raid wiped out his camels and more servants, and then all of his children, unfortunately, were killed uh, when a great wind leveled the house that they were all gathered in. So Job experienced all of this and did what most, most of us would do in that situation. He completely rejected and cursed God, right? wrong. <laughs> Job's response to these awful tragedies is actually recorded in verses 20 to 22 of chapter 1 when it says, Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell on the ground and worshipped. Uh, and he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. So despite experiencing unimaginable tragedy, um, tragedy that most of us probably haven't been through or never will go through, Job remained blameless and upright as God had described him. He worshipped God in spite of his current circumstances. In chapter 2, verse 3, God's sure to point this out to Satan. He says, He still holds fast his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without reason. Awesome job, Job. You passed the test. Well, not quite. Satan isn't done and responds to God in verses 4 and 5 when he says, Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, all that a man has he will give for his life. But stretch out your hand and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you to your face. So God allows one more round of tests. Uh, he's going to give Satan a chance to go after him again with really only one stipulation or one caveat. He's not allowed to kill Job, but anything up to that point is okay. Satan decided to attack, decides to attack Job with boils, big, open, awful wounds from head to toe. It's so agonizing that Job just sits on the ground scraping his boils with shards of pottery. Uh, so bad, in fact, that in chapter 2, verse 9, Job's wife, who actually survived all of the original trials as well, she finally breaks and says, do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. So he's lost just about everything he has, lost so many loved ones that he knows, his children, his servants, all of his livestock, all this sort of stuff, and now his wife, his support, has turned against him. Well, fortunately, Job's friends come to comfort him, but if you know the story of Job, it doesn't turn out too well. Basically, chapters 4 through 37 are dialogue back and forth between Job and his friends. And it's basically Job's friends telling him over and over how awful he must be <laughs> to deserve all these trials that God's putting him through and that he needs to repent and that he must be an awful sinner and all that. And through all this, Job continues to defend himself and stay true to God and stay devoted to God. But despite his devotion to God... Job does get honest with God about his feelings and asks why all these things have happened. Well, finally, in chapter 38 of Job, God speaks. And when he speaks, he completely shuts down Job and his friends. 
Um, he reminds them that he alone is in control of all things, including the earth and the heavens. And he mostly does this by just asking rhetorical questions, questions that Job can't ask and isn't meant to ask. Things like, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. And in reference to the heavens and um, the um, constellations, he asks, can you bind the chains of the Pleiades or loose the cords of Orion? Can you lead forth the Maseroth in their season or can you guide the bear with its children? For maybe the first time uh, through this book, Job actually responds the way probably most, if not all of us, would respond. Uh, he basically can't. He's essentially speechless. Uh, in chapter 40, verses 4 and 5, after God's first round of questioning, Job says, Behold, I am of small account. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand on my mouth. I have spoken once, and I will not answer twice, but I will proceed no further. Job kind of got a wake-up call. He, he realized he had no place to question God, no right to do that in this, in this situation. Uh, the God of the universe, the creator of all things, just reminded him that even though Job's life seemed out of control and the trials seemed unfair, there were things going on and forces much, much bigger than, uh, than him and what Job understood in the moment. There's so many lessons we can actually learn from Job's experience, but I picked out three that I think are particularly um, relevant to what we're going through here in 2020. Number one, God is in control, period. Uh, Colossians 1.17 says, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. As a follower of Jesus Christ, I find that actually extremely comforting, knowing that um, absolutely nothing surprises God, and nothing is beyond his control or out of his control. Uh, so even when things seem kind of crazy, you can find comfort in knowing that it's not happening without God knowing and without him approving it, essentially. Number two, perspective is crucial. Uh, Paul tells us in Romans 8.6, for the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. Job and especially his friends uh, lost focus. Uh, their mindset was on temporal things, things that were going to pass away and not on the on an eternity. We all struggle with this. We're human. We're sinful. Um, so we often get so focused on ourselves and what we're going through that we just completely forget that God is, is using us or at least trying to use us and working through us in any circumstance we're going through. When our mind is set on the flesh, the negative aspects of our life are magnified while God's grace and mercy completely fades away. But when our minds are set on the spirit, on God himself, it allows us to tap into that peace of God which surpasses all understanding, as Philippians 4, 7 says. And that comes in quite handy when we're running through trials and uh, especially pertinent now here in 2020. Uh, so, Point one, God is in control. Point two, perspective is crucial. And point three, God is always with us. Um, Isaiah 43, two through three, gives us this promise from God. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned. And the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. So we can rest assured that when life does get tough, uh, that we're not alone. God's with us always. The same God that came to earth in human form and paid the ultimate price to save us from our sins. So whatever the second half of this year, 2020, has in store, we can always look to the promises of God to help us through. All right, if you made it this far, uh, I'd like to ask you to reflect on how you've handled the trials of 2020 so far. Um, have you been overwhelmed with fear? Has this year caused you to question God's judgment in your life or maybe even his existence? If you've done any of those things, don't beat yourself up. Um, I think every Christian goes through these moments uh, during their walk with Christ uh, at least once, if not continuously over and over. Uh, but go to God with it. Um, work through it. You, it's 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 okay to deal with, or it's okay to have happen or have those thoughts go through your mind, but um, not to linger on them. You gotta, gotta work through those things. Grab a trusted friend or one of the church staff or elders to help you through if you need it. Uh, but always remember, again, that God is in control. Remember to set your mind on the spirit and remember God is always with you. Take care and God bless.